Uh, you have some questions for me. Go ahead. We're kind of in the declining, declining mode, so... Shoot. While you go about that, I will try to put in some plays on these. What's my PhD in? Uh, it is in bi in the field of biology, uh, more specifically molecular biology, and I specifically looked at genetics in the context of RNA viruses. So we're going from like the actual PhD is very broad, right? PhD in biology. But then, it filters down to all those other things. Like, biology at the top, more specialized molecular biology, more specialized uh, genetics, and then more specialized virology. And then, very specific RNA viruses. Well, you have some questions about mainly tapping. Oh, that's interesting. I recently adapted to a new playstyle, and the strain has gone from my wrist to your arm. Think this is better or worse for stamina? Um, strain uh, comes in many forms, right? Um, I would imagine it's a radiating one, right? It's like not localized strain, like. Have you ever hung on something with one of your hands? So just like dead hang and then right here on somewhere in the back of your arm in your forearm starts just it gets really hot, right? That's usually a uh, strain for sure. But that is um, largely a separation between whether you're uh, taxing your finger strain like there is some stiffness in this knuckle but if it's your forearm stuff that's kind of like a pretty decent workout so and it's localized like you're not having like pinching pains anywhere that's usually like nice for stamina that's that's like a burn stamina in my opinion i guess also asking if soreness after a day of hard 
stamina training is a good thing and if I should st still play lighter maps while sore or just not play OS today? Um, that's a interesting question. Um, generally, like if I were to spin like a lot of normal things, like let's treat not OS at like let's treat OS more closer to fitness, like what I understand about biomechanics and fitness. Um, when you get DOMS, right, delay onset of muscle soreness in these areas, um, it is generally adapting as you might have expected, adapting to a new mechanic or like a new mechanical movement and that soreness does subside um eventually when you normalize but you do get early uh you do get more intense doms when you start a new uh movement like for example if you've never done a squat before and you're going to do a squat um for the first time in your life and then you do a I don't know, a 30 minute routine, you are going to feel incredibly sore the next day. Now, whether that prevents you from working out if you so choose, you have to ask yourself if that soreness is interfering with your execution of the form, right? The mechanic. If it does interfere, um, resting for even a week is fine. Uh, mechanical like, muscle soreness uh, is not necessarily an indicator of injury or anything like that. And generally, when you're doing something mechanical, uh, your typical brain, like your typical retention of that mechanics can go as high as two weeks. Like even novel mechanics, it can still carry for more than two weeks. So you can choose to wait for the soreness to go away if it's really affecting your intelligent like your emotional state right to go on however one of the most recent ideas or the most recent trends that are supported by literature is that soreness um when you vascularize so when you actually actively engage that muscle that sto soreness is addressed so when you rest, you will have soreness more so than when you're actively doing it. So if you want that soreness to go away without actually working out quicker, a light activity is fine. I, I think actually most people would recommend a light activity. So you take active rest days. So uh, like you said, doing something lighter while you're sore is excellent. It actually and promote at the time less soreness so soreness goes uh generally subsides when you actively move that place so you can choose to do active rest days if you want so go hard one day go light one day go hard one day go light or only go you know just go light when you are sore and eventually it uh, normalizes itself that's usually how it goes for beginner. Like what I mean is beginner gains is the, I call it the honeymoon period. Basically when you acquire new new mechanic, you dip really hard on the soreness. However, you can always choose to actively do active rest. Um, you can still push yourself relatively the same level if that's manageable to you. Um, I, I typically personally choose to just do active rest days. So, uh, right now, like I didn't push as hard because I'm going into the fatigue state now. So I'm w looking forward to my rest. Uh, I guess also asking if soreness, right? I noticed that before I switched to new technique, I was using 100% wrist strain and it made single tapping, stamina, and control impossible. Ooh, yeah, I, I, I feel you on that one. I definitely feel you on that one. So I guess now you're off the wrist and more on the forearm. I'm, I've been on the forearm quite a bit now. The forearm is definitely where that warm sensation is like it feels 
uh, to me, it almost feels nice when my forearm, this little particular part in the forearm starts warming. It gets a little hot. And that's what I mean by when I say strain. Like, oh yeah, that's a little strainier than usual. So it's getting like heated a lot earlier than I would expect. So I generally use it as an indicator. Like if it's super hot, I'm like, yeah, it's time to back up a little. In case it helps, my new technique is about the same, but my elbow is hanging off the desk. Yes. Uh, my, so you're floating a bit, yeah. Instead of an armrest, yep. Which helps offset the strain, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very close to what I do as well. I think I can play O's today. Uh, yeah, I'll go light. Not sure what percent of the max is considered going light though. That, no one can answer for you until you actually do it. So, um, the, the biggest rule of thumb, in my opinion, and maybe a lot of other people, is when you have sharp pain, when you have localized pain, like, you literally can point where the pain is coming from, that's when you definitely need to stop. Like, it, it's one of those things. Like, if you have sharp, prickly pain, like pins and needles in exact areas, that is often a time like, yeah, you, you probably just want to just chill out. Um, when you have huge, like, warming stuff, that's usually delayed onset muscle soreness, really. You have to keep in mind, you don't really have to actively do things light. If you rest up, if you rest up, Larry, if you rest up, you're still improving. Uh, if so, like oftentimes, especially in the beginning, when you're really sore and you just rest for like three days straight, the thing that stops people is they get, they don't establish a habit, right? That's what stops them. Not because they're not improving. When you're, if you rest for the next three days and you have the motivation and the consistency to come back and do that again, you'll probably have very similar gains than doing the light activity in the first place. The reason why it's very encouraged that you shouldn't rest for too long is really because you haven't established a habit yet. So when people pick up like workout routines, they generally don't add more than one or two rest days in between exercises because the goal is to create a habit and that stops the person from working out more likely than telling that person, hey, if you rest three days and just work out really hard two days, you'll still get the same out, very, very similar output than working out all five days, like separated. It's largely contributed to volume, volume training. So as long as your volume is put in, like you placed in volume and the amount of exertion, you can rest as long as you want. Like generally two, two weeks is the upper, like a, a starting point for most people. So if you worked really, really, really hard one day and just rest two weeks, you're probably still fine. That's the very upper limit, though. Like, the average upper limit. Um, work out once. Like, play O's really long and grueling one week. Uh, one day a week. And you rest the rest. It's probably negligible. Uh, like, so you liberate all those six days, right? Then you can go about and do whatever you want for those six days. You can work on other skills. When you're liberating. The question is. Can you do that? Like mentally and emotionally. Can you do that regularly? For most people. It's far far more consistent. To say. Say you need to play. Your workout regime is 10 hours of OS. Right? Just 10 hours of constant tapping. That's your volume goal. How are you going to spread that around? A person can choose to do 10 hours one day and rest the rest of the week from O's, but do everything else. Or 
you can choose to put place like one and a half hours across uh, six days, then you'll get your 10 hours and then you rest one day. So that's kind of the idea. What leads to more consistent practice? What leads to more consistent uh, scheduling? I'm a microdoser. So instead of running a marathon once a week, which is uh, 26 miles, I don't know what that is in kilometers, 100 kilometers? I have no idea, actually. Actually, it might be 40, 40 kilometers. 26 miles, somewhere around 40 to 45 kilometers. I could do that once a week. Or just run like a fraction of it across all the days. And I usually choose more frequency than not. So I, I, I mean, I'm not actually running 20 miles or uh, 40 kilometers a week. I'm running half that. Actually, Three, three miles a day times seven, that's 21 miles. Close, close. I'm running less than that. So I'm running 20 miles, 21 miles a day, which is 35 kilometers a week. I could choose to do that in like three days, run like seven miles one day, take two days rest, then run seven miles, then two days rest, then run seven miles. And that's about a, a week's uh, a week duration. So that's kind of what I would say. You um, when it comes to physical training and stiffness and pain management and all that stuff and recovery, you got to work that out. Work that, negotiate that with yourself. And then, if you do this with O's, you can do this with so many other things. It works with your mind. It works with Learning a language, it works. That, that's the idea. The goal is to find the natural balance for you to consistently, both emotionally and intellectually and physically, line up so that you can form habits and drop habits whenever you like. Dropping habits, there's some nuances to dropping habits, but generally speaking, in this time frame, with new skills, it's probably easier to drop the habit than it is to form the habit. Well, it's more of a case of I want to play, but I don't want to bottleneck my improvement. Oh, okay. So you have pre previous encounters with possibly injuring yourself from um, overtraining. My stamina has been slowing down due to less play time, taking a couple of days between sessions. Uh, stamina. Uh, I'm not sure about hands, right? Hand stamina. I, the closest thing I can, t uh, can associate is, uh, playing a musical instrument, playing a instrument. And usually stamina has at least a one week to two week period. And I'm using that two week average for stamina, muscular stuff, like things about musk, like strength and dexterity. That's like greater than a month, maybe even two to three months as a starting position for most people. For stamina, it's two weeks. Like you have at least a two week window to start. So you don't necessarily depreciate in stamina. There are things that affect stamina that isn't literally your body telling you. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. You may not be in the same mood like in the same health conscious mindset that will impact your perception of your stamina. Uh, after running consistently consecutively for over 400 days, I can, uh, after tracking all the time, my mood impacts my, uh, perception of stamina quite a lot. Even if I'm timing, just syncing up my times for running and the way I feel can uh, dramatically be impacted by the way I feel.
So if you are not both mentally and physically rested, generally speaking, you're already bottlenecking your stamina training. So oftentimes, erring on the side of being rested and then engaging in stamina training tends to be far more efficient with your use of time. The downside to this is you don't get to play oaths very often, as much, as often as you like. Uh, however, you said it's largely you don't want to bottleneck your improvement and not necessarily the enjoyment of oaths. So if you're okay with bottlenecking how often you get to enjoy oaths, then you're not, uh, the likelihood of you bottlenecking by resting longer for the improvement is a non issue. If you have no trouble going back and playing O's after a long rest period or wanting to play O's after a long rest period, rest period, longer rest periods are generally more advisable, in my opinion, than actually doing active resting. The downside is you don't get to enjoy O's. So if that's what keeps you playing O's, that's a bottleneck. You gotta weigh which one's important. Your step right. Does soreness indicate improvement, do you think? It does not. Unfortunately, soreness is just an indicator of your recovery period. So no no not necessarily the improvement as in like did your stamina improve? It's a component that's really, in my opinion, in a separate category of its own. It kind of sometimes tell you after you become consistent, right? After you do this consistently, it might tell you your steady state, as in how possibly slightly how hard you're working each time, but not in the beginning. It doesn't tell you anything in the beginning. It just tells you you're new. Whatever you just did, the other day is completely new. That that's where that soreness is coming from. Eventually though, once you do it consistent enough, it could tell you if you're pushing harder. Or it could be telling you if you have build up fatigue, which I do. Right now, I've been quote unquote declining, right? If you're looking at where I was in week two and week three, I technically declined, but that's because of fatigue build. I've been doing this 30 days consecutively and fatigue is going to build on that. It's not pain or overwork. It's just I know I cannot push myself hard enough until I rest. So uh, generally soreness is a poor indicator if you're improving in stamina. You can only improve, you can only see the improvement in stamina is when your mindset, your emotional and intellectual state is as good as it can be and you're physically rested, then you'll actually know if there's an improvement. And you have to keep that condition static. As in the next time you measure yourself, you also have to be in that same mind, body state and then push yourself. And this requires record keeping. This requires forming an intuition. So it's not the same as getting a miss message where you measure yourself after 20 days of training. Like for me, I would not tell myself that my 30 day training, number 30 is gonna be anywhere near, for me, usually is around day eight. Day eight and nine is when I peak. And then I enter fatigue. So I slowly become fatigued. So 30 will, um, you can choose when to compare yourself, but you have to record long enough to know it when it's similar. So I would generally only compare myself the first week to the next time I do my first week. I wouldn't compare myself to what I am now, number 30, to the first day. Improvements quote unquote, improvements generally, biologically, only happen when you're resting. So the more often you rest in between like exercises, whatever you're doing, that's when you improve. And you're measuring if there is improvement after the fact. 
So when you go to do your exercise, you have to normalize all your conditions and then you can measure it. And then improvement comes when you rest. So you work hard to be able to rest. If you don't increase your threshold and then rest after it, generally speaking, yes, that would lead to stagnation a lot of times. How long is considered longer rest? And can a person still improve fast if they play every day, do you think? Yes, uh, they can improve every day, for sure. Uh, will they improve? I guess you mean uh, not fast in general. You mean still improve. Uh, you're suggesting if it improves faster or slower or like compared to someone who's resting, right? So you have to be comparing to something. Uh, the The answer to that for most people, like what I mean is the people who focus on fitness and skill building, it's usually it's negligible. It's not significantly faster. So if you play every day, if you play every day or you rest, it's not statistically significantly faster most of the time. So on paper and on trials, when you have trained people or untrained people, the thing that we're talking about is untrained, which doesn't deal with the whole training every day. But once a person becomes trained, it's negligible, it, generally speaking, statistically negligible on someone who trains every day or trains and rests. The person who typically trains every day and they're a trained professional have enough rest periods that total the amount of downtime a person who trains really hard and then have a long rest day, hard and long rest day. Generally, the volume that all the athletes do are very similar across the board. And the volume of rest periods across the board is similar. As in, like, even if you get a trained person to work on and off for 30 days, decondition that, and then get that athlete to work every day and have those rest periods, I would argue that most of the time it would not be statistically significant. So you have to think about it in a sense that you are comparing yourself who rests train, rest, train, versus your sub who is training every day and resting less in between. In the end of the day, your volume, if you train and just like keep notes, right? Keep notes and see what works for you. Ultimately, you'll probably end up statistically doing very similar amount of volume as in the total amount of work you did and how much rest period. Right? It's, it's not enough to rationalize if your mindset's not there. So the, the wild card here is, can you do it for a very long time and be content with it? So which one fits you better, right? Like, which one do you enjoy better? Do you like your rest days or do you like being consistently doing the whole thing. I do it, I do my OS thing this way is because I'm practicing something that I don't typically do. So this is different. I don't practice often ma many of my skills every single day. However, I'm doing that with running and this. And then I'm just gonna take a really long break. Like, after 31 days, I know that I only last like two weeks. At most, my peak is within two weeks. It's at the end of the first week is, a, is where so it's between the intersection between the first and second week. So in the future, I'm probably just going to do two weeks straight and then take a week off or something. I, I benefit from long rest periods because I like to go and do other things. Uh, consecutively. So whenever I rest one or two weeks from OS, I'm doing something else for one or two weeks and then it goes back and forth. So that's kind of my thing that I enjoy over time.
probably your last question. Do you notice differences in strain when you're streaming compared to when I'm single tapping? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's for me, I single tap differently than I alternate. So for me, absolutely. I don't know about you though. Uh, there are individuals, at least I know, you know, like people who fully alt, they can still single tap the way they, uh, alternate. I don't, I single tap very different from alternating. And also it doesn't, uh, uh, what I'm doing now when I'm practicing, there's no stop and going. So, um, it's not going to be the same when I play maps. So this isn't trend. The, the thing that I'm training is not transferable completely to playing maps. Playing maps requires start and stopping. And this is just start and then do the rest. So uh, I'll have problems start and stopping. More strain when single tapping. Uh, and, and it's, it's hard for me to know. So, uh, at the moment I haven't ever single tapped at the pace. So if you have more strain single tapping that, I mean, one reasonable ex explainer would be something like maybe single tapping requires a larger range of motion for you. Uh, for me. Single tapping is usually more strenuous because uh, it has a larger range of motion. Like there's more things engaged in it uh, as opposed to lightly tapping back and forth. And it's an inconsistency thing. So I'm juggling more things. Uh, other people don't. They treat, for example, someone I know, they treat anything that deals with multiple inputs the same. So they have the same muscular tension, the same execution uh, outside of single tapping, the, the person that I am aware of. Um, for me, uh, it's very different. So it's more strenuous for single tapping. I, I know that for sure, because I'm actually spending more energy, expending more energy. But yeah, you have to ask yourself. No worries, Flurry. You gotta ask yourself, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, just, uh, you can, uh, leave your, I mean, I can do it now. Here, let me find you. I actually don't know how to add people on O's laser, so this is going to be an experience. Yeah. So let's see, where do you... Oh, I know, it's uh... Here it is. Okay. Uh... No, that's not, that's not it. No. Uh, hmm. That was F9, but uh, that's not it. I'm thinking of- oh, oh, I know. Wait. No, I'm thinking of a- uh, oh, wait. No. That's not it. Yeah, the- oh. No. <laughs> uh, this is a good. This is a good. Ex this is a good example. So, uh, it's good to know this. Um,
Yeah, all this says is uh, the dashboard is view your friends and spectate other players. There's no ranking. Uh, there's no ranking in this. Uh, in Ost Laser, there's no ranking display. It's not. I passed it. Oh, this ranking. Okay. I don't think that helps. <laughs> uh. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, you are this person. I was kind of curious if you were this person earlier. Well, nice to meet you. Actually, I'm kind of curious. Are you? Are you? Yeah. It's okay. I can do it elsewhere, but... You know I'm a little bit... How do I know this is you? It's fine. Oh. As in, like, in this gate? You mean in here? Wait, where did you DM me? Oh. Oh. Uh, okay. How do I... I've already done this before, hang on. One second. I'll just do it here. Hold up. I'll do it here. We're, go we're going off, s off screen. Uh, yeah, no, there's no way to add. What the heck? Alright, this will work. There we go. It only works on the site. Maybe it's not supposed to work right now. Yeah, no, it doesn't. That's kind of weird. Yeah, so I just did it on the website. Wait. So... What are you switching up? I'm, I'm actually really curious. What are you switching up? It seems like you've played O's forever, so what have you swapped up? I, yeah, I have... It's not intuitive, at least. Okay, let's... Let's both agree, right? That O's laser... Let's both agree that Ost Laser, it's not really clear how you add friends. Hold up. Maybe I'm doing the- wait, wait, what if we go here? Wait. Right? It doesn't- uh, it doesn't even update. The dashboard doesn't update. Do I have to log out first and then- like, I already did it on the website. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it doesn't make it clear how you add people. Wait, wait, wait. Hold up. What if we go to... Oh, right. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll just worry about it later. You, your single tapping is very rough and ruins your stamina. And my control isn't up to my expectations because of bad technique. 
That's interesting. I don't know how you determine what's bad technique at your competency. Your aim at reading is also bad compared to your speed. It just takes... And why does... You know, the downside of YouTube chat is this little emo thing is always in the way. Your aim is also bad to compare to your speed, but that just takes work outside of speed training. Interesting. I guess you're looking for what your bottleneck is, right? Like, uh, just from a standpoint, just from someone who doesn't play O's, right? Doesn't play O's the way you play O's at this point. Uh, you're looking for what is capping yourself. You have plenty of a lot of things, but you're specifically looking to address the thing that is capping you right now. So what I consider bad technique was I would tense up my wrist tons, which made my aim hand tense too from how much I'm tensing. Oh yeah, that's understandable. Yeah. So you are leaning towards the idea that as much as long as you can alleviate the tension on your wrist, that is what's bringing down all of your other performances. So you're looking for any p potential inspiration on how to alleviate your wrist strain more than you had previously. Interesting. So like whatever your wrist strain was before, you want it to not happen. Uh, you want it to be less frequent. I think so other than reading, which I've always been bad at. You're bad at reading? I don't, I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. Oh, you don't play enough reading maps? Okay. Uh, that's another component, right? We're not talking... Uh, I guess um, the stuff we've been talking about is not related to reading. Um, or like the that other component of what you're doing right now. And then notice, yeah, I, I'm aware. Yeah, the high density stuff. That That is uh, another component. I That's a component of O's that I kind of enjoy quite, quite a bit. Just staring at that kind of thing but obviously I have no mechanic understanding on how to do it when you put it all together um huh well here here's something to be sobering right I want to I want to give you a sobering idea there's no guarantee that the thing you're doing now is gonna not develop wrist strain in the future generally speaking Arms, wrists, and hands are kind of attached in one, like, one go. So if you're taxing your forearm, at some point, your wrist does promote, uh, does uh, translate some of that uh, motion all the way up to your arm. The idea here is, though, it kind of sounds like you've offset a lot of the taxing on your wrists uh, and offload it onto your arm which is which can help uh, extend the life of your wrist so like your wrist is now doing less work than your arm which allows you to stay on tasks longer right shakes are kept at bay for longer if you're if you come if you're positive that the weakest point is your wrist Improving reading is mainly just playing more new maps of what you want to get better at. Yes, it's uh, your intellectual component has to be through exposure. Exposure is the uh, is largely the most consistent component to improving intellectual things, to improve like knowledge checks and stuff. Yes, that's how you become really great, though. So you know. 
like it, it is a tough balance right when you're practicing novel things there's no guarantee that they won't interfere with what you've been training on for a while so it's like um when you're trying to improve your reading skills you have to do just enough to refresh your memory on all the things you built and then spend extra time on new stuff right so that you keep reinforcing the old stuff keeping them up to date so naturally it'd be like warming up with everything that you've done before and then exploring the new stuff warming up with everything you've done before and then the new stuff that you had becomes more and more part of your warm-up and then you just keep going back and forth it's kind of like schoolwork that's generally how schoolwork works so you know if you think about how school is structured right you learn the new material the new material eventually gets reviewed and you hope to lock in that material lock in that material and then you constantly use that material to learn new material and then a new material eventually becomes your old material and then you keep expanding from there and reading in my opinion if you want to naturally approach it that way that's usually the system you want to go at and you have to develop a way that keeps yourself motivated in doing that for sure i don't unfortunately i don't play os at a competent level that i can tell you anything about how to achieve that e even mechanically uh what i generally do is uh just talk about ideas that you know an experienced person may for have forgotten one of the things about like resting is that uh Resting is something very passionate and skilled O's player forgotten. They tend to forget to rest. And improvements on generally only occur when resting. Hey Worm. Hello. You have a tendency to just play the same- Yeah, we are playing maps. I'm used to is fun. Yes, exactly. It's a comfort zone, right? It's uh, intellectually less taxing and uh very comforting but if i don't play new stuff i get more inconsistent yes absolutely uh wait inconsistent on the stuff that you already play or inconsistent as in the new stuff become the other stuff you don't play become more inconsistent because that's naturally very very uh um that that would follow very logically right so in my opinion right both really oh that's interesting wait 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 wait. that's that's interesting that um if you're i am reading youtube chat uh worm i'm talking with flary right now uh on, on youtube that that's really different that if you're constantly playing maps that you're used to and not playing new things make you less consistent in the things you used to play generally my go-to psychological explainer for that is that you have become complacent as in for example if you do something a lot right it can be fun however you become complacent so what i mean is you become looser there's nothing that is uh it's becoming more and more efficient but when it's things become more and more efficient and fun it's uh less and less taxing so you do less and less work if your sessions it'll, it'll get to the point where your sessions are so long that you can't possibly get to the point where you have enough volume for your consistency anymore so uh, a good example of this is like when you get really good at something right it feels like it's less and less taxing but to get the same amount of work so the idea is if you're physically both intellectually and physically trying to get better at something the goal is to reach past your threshold in a reasonable amount of time 
and then rest. And resting improves you past that threshold. So if you keep doing things you find fun and you get used to, you're becoming more and more efficient. So you do less and less work in the same amount of time. So in order to compensate, you have to play longer and longer, right? And you're constantly going to be playing longer and longer. It's going to get so long that your sessions are going to get so long, you can't possibly even hit that to even give enough time to rest, right? So the, that's the trade-off, right? So the goal now is you have to, uh, I would highly encourage you to contract your sessions by working harder somehow and then liberating that extra time to rest. I don't know what that looks like because I'm not but I'm, I'm not a specialist in Osu. Like I, I don't play Osu, Osu that much. Um, the idea is you're trying to get the same, you're trying to pass the effort threshold. So you're getting to strain, like you're edging out in strain quicker. The quicker you edge out into strain safely, you rest. So what I would do is to play every day for like two weeks, then rest for like three days. That's excellent. Then repeat. So yeah, definitely right about, yeah. Yeah, three days is still kind of not enough. Um, yeah, three days is kind of tough. You can still make it work though. I, I still feel if you're not, if you're really vegging out, right? But I imagine you play other games and other things. You're using your hands for other things. So I have really long sessions now, but my improvement hasn't sped up because I'm never pushing for improvement. Bad way to play. Yes. So what I'm saying is it's not necessarily bad. It's just really comforting. Like it, it, it's nice. It feels good. Um, it's not necessarily ideal for improvement. I think you want me to upload? Th yeah. Well, well, let's go into this digression, right? This is going to be our digression for today. I ch generally chunk this up. So, um, Let's just take fitness, for example. So in general, like say, I, I don't know if you lift weights or run or jog or do cardiovascular stuff, but the most, in, uh, the most uh, easy to, you used to. So say, uh, let's use O's, right? Let's use O's. Say your session right now is six hours. I don't know what your session is, but six hours is a really long time. Think about, uh, we can normalize how much work hours. Like most people work out, work, like do jobs eight hours a day, right? Five times a week. Let's just say if your session is eight hours, how much work are you doing? So I can't answer any of these questions, right? The semantics, the context is all up to you. You are a, you are way more skilled. You have all these things. So say how you feel after eight hours. Your volume for that eight hours. Your goal is try to get to a state faster than eight hours. So once you reduce it to six hours, you gain two hours of rest. And then when you do that six hours, right, you'll become used to it. Then you'll become more and more efficient. Then you'll extend back to eight hours. It'll, it'll feel like to get to that point, it'll be eight hours. Then you're going to compress again. And you liberate two, two days of rest day. So what happens over time is that the work you're doing in the eight hours is increasing in load. However, you're not constantly expanding the session. You're increasing your workload. So in, in a weightlifting, what does this look like in weightlifting? Just to think about um, first day, you know, like you're trained now and your low, your workout is one hour as long, right? It's one hour long. And to get to exhaustion, which is when you feel strained, and not like sharp pain or we're talking about like when your arms are just oh it's like really worked out 
that is your end point, right? A lot of times people say muscular fatigue or near failure, like 90% near failure. So when you, you know, because you're well experienced in OS, so you know when you reach that point. The goal is say, when you're weightlifting, in that one hour period, you reached it. So you keep doing that. You just keep doing the same routine and eventually you'll get to a point like, wait a minute. This one hour, I'm not tired anymore. So what you do is you extend, you're gonna end up naturally extending your session, right? It's gonna be two hours now. So let's just say now you ended up with two hours. This is the opportune moment where you can say, well, how can I get tired in one hour? So when you see your sessions increase, it's a time where you can choose to decrease it back. And when you decrease it back, you're, you've actually effectively increased your load, but achieving it at the same time frame. And the goal is to constantly keep your sessions at a fixed time frame while liberating, constantly combating, becoming more and more efficient. So when you become more efficient, you're actually doing less work. You're doing less work, but you're gaining more output. Like the output is better. You're just more efficient. So if you keep seeing your sessions get longer, the goal is to contract it and work harder during a smaller period of time. Because the more rest time you have that you liberate, and you can safely increase the intensity of your sessions, that recovery time is where you improve. So ideally, if you're a maximalist, say you're like someone who really, really loves to improve, like squeeze everything out. Your goal is try to work as intense as possible safely. Remember, you have to be safe about this. If you're aiming to maximize your time, like a 30 minute session and get like break your arm in, it has to be safe. So what you're doing is you're slowly compressing your time to the point where you can safely get to fatigue. And then you can maintain it there. Naturally, it'll get longer and longer again. And then you retract back. That's kind of the goal. Because uh, no one wants to practice like eight hours straight uh, or 10 hours straight. Um, this is um, the thing I'm sharing is how marathoners do it. So people who have to run you know, uh, 50 kilometers, right, a day, they have to f find some way to become more and more efficient. So they do like speed training, like they try to compress and work harder in a smaller amount of time while constantly working harder. And then when you get to the performance side, you reap, you know, when they participate in tournaments and stuff, you reap the benefits by being more efficient in your competition. But for yourself, you generally never want, like, you generally don't want to become more and more efficient. Like, if you're doing something like me, where if you do something straight for 30 days, it's going to become less and less work. All right. Let's put a scenario to mind. Comparing a person who pushes themselves to max for six hours, someone who plays two hours of training, and four hours of light work or just two hours of max in OS terms. So we don't necessarily have to, uh, we don't necessarily have to compare um, the training regimen because we don't know what that's going to do to the OS player. Uh, in this case, the thing you can focus on is your endpoint, right? and switch from like speed to aim to speed to aim um ultimately ultimately here's here's the thing you're talking about now it's a different component now uh there's another bottleneck here and that's which one gives out first so this is more like a left arm versus right arm thing right so if you're uh let's say you're doing lunges 
I don't know if you know what a lunge is, but you know, you can do a lunge with by stepping forward with your left leg or your right leg. In this case, in O's, your right hand or your left hand. So when you're switching components, emphasis components, one is going to be a rate limiting step versus the other one. So which hand gives out first? Because your session ends when one of the component fails. Like, the moment you reach muscular fatigue in one of your hands, you can choose to do an exercise that doesn't involve that hand. That's an option. Or you stop, and what you're trying to do is normalize the stamina in your right hand versus your left hand so that you raise the bottleneck of one of them. So like a runner is only as fast as their weakest leg, right? So how do you train that? Well, you stop and rest at the weakest leg because no matter how strong the other leg is, you're gonna hit overtraining your weakest leg if you keep thinking about what your other component can do. So if you're training speed and speed involves you still aiming, and your aim hand is bottlenecking and you're using your speed hand as an indicator when you should stop your right your aim hand is going to be overtrained right because it's not equipped to do so you can choose to do something like oh yeah you, you you clearly see that your aim hand is failing you can just use your you can try to come up with some clever way of only using your speed hand right or something like you can compartmentalize it and work splits kind of like when you go into a gym you can split not entirely true like completely but like someone who goes in work chest then they work their back another day they work their legs another day it's still not completely isolated but the general idea is if one side, if one thing is bottlenecking you, you can choose to continue training if you want, but you have to let the thing that's bottlenecking you rest, or else it won't improve. And if you keep using it, it'll be overtrained. Um, when it comes to the body, when you're working out body, most people stop the moment their weakest part stops. Because uh, eventually the weakest part catches up with your strongest part. Unfortunately in O's, your right hand and your left hand are doing distinctively different things. It, it's different from like working out where you can like do a bicep curl on your right hand and a bicep curl on your left hand. You can definitely probably do more bicep curls on your stronger arm. However, if you want to normalize both of them in sync, you stop whenever your weakest arm fails. In O's, you can choose to do that or not, because the whole competency and performance of the game involves both your hands being good, right? So if you want to truly normalize both of them instead of having a bottleneck, you stop when one of your hands, one of your components is failing. It doesn't have to be that way. You can always train like tapping without training aim and your like your aim component. Do you think stamina training and speed training is best at the start or the end of a session for most optimal results? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I prefer playing whatever in the middle of a session. Naturally speaking and statistically speaking, you are both highest in stamina training or stamina training is near the end. Speed training is in the middle. So uh, speed training is the balance between when you are warmed up, right? When you are warmed up, so it looks like a bell curve usually. When your peak speed is when you've warmed up, so you've loosened up and gotten your dexterity back, and then you're still rested, as in you expended as the least amount of effort to warm up, to get your dexterity back, and then you have 
you're at peak energy. Stamina training is at the very end, because the very end is the component where you're trying to improve. Stamina is like, stamina is generally a really flat line, and then right near the end, it just falls off of a planet. Like, it just dips really hard. It's usually the last couple seconds, or last couple minutes, relatively to what you're doing. Uh, I would say Os is probably the last hour. If I take a professional Os player there and their relative sessions, I would say it's probably the last 30 minutes, 30 or an hour. So th that is the most important interval that you're trying to extend. Because stamina is when you're near fatigue, right? So that is the window that you're trying to improve. When you push the fatigue window, past its limit, that sets a new fatigue window. So you're basically at 99% until you're not. Like just stamina and endurance is you're, you're great, you're great, you're great, and suddenly you're just not. So it's usually at the end of the window. So if you're like a long distance runner and you're running, the whole idea is to pace. Everything is about pacing everything out evenly and then the last end is the divider. Like if you got your pace, you should be near 100% the whole way until the end. So the harder you push in the end, the bigger your stamina window will become when you, uh, when you rest. So generally, uh, like these sessions, I do stamina, like I, I can't, do act and stuff and whatnot but for stamina training it's usually the end and when you're pushing very very hard safely the very last one when your fingers are kind of like at failure and it's kind of like crunchy that's your stamina window if if that makes sense speed is peak performance uh, when dexterity is max so you don't want stamina to get in the way like, you, you shouldn't be tired, right? If you're tired, it's just going to impact your speed. So you have to be in the most rested state and the most warmed up state. And generally, that's in the middle. Uh, if you're wondering what happens in the beginning, like the warm-up phase, the warm-up phase is recovery. So uh, it, it deals with your constitution which is how quickly you recover, like de-rust is part of recovery. So how you uh, get back into the groove as quickly as possible. And that, sometimes, generally speaking, has the most, has a very prevalent genetic component, right? Recovery varies by people, but warm-up or no warm-up, some people go without warm-up. It varies dramatically, like, ex like professional athletes Many of them don't warm up because their whole life they're always prepped ready Or like some people need to warm up for a very long time That component is very sporadic the warm-up period, but generally once you're rested warm That's your speed component for the most part And your aim and everything else actually when you're rested intellectually like you're not Drained or anything anything that pushes past a dexterity limit intelligence which is aim and reading uh, a lot of times. I, I would say that's an intelligence component. And dexterity is like how fast your hand moves around and how your hand aims. That's usually in the middle most of the time. Uh, of this conversation, so... Or, oh, that's the hypothetical. Wait, wait, wait. From this conversation, instead of OSing for 6 hours, I'll probably make a 2 hour routine for speed and stamina, right? And a bit of aim and reading, and study for college with some- with the more spare time. Yeah, absolutely. That's- that's killing many birds with one stone. While you're- with the extra time that you're studying for college, you are improving. You are resting. So you're trying as best as you can to make more time available to you to rest. So you can do anything else while resting. Uh, 
and the six hour session is absolutely the bottleneck like overall when it comes to performance based things in the long run in the long run uh it's the amount of time like as a kid and as someone who needs to go to school even get a job and stuff it's difficult to keep doing the same thing the same way and very comfortably because you will naturally get better at it even doing schoolwork will become more efficient the the downside of that is if you're looking to improve you have to keep doing more if you're doing the same thing so the goal is to keep doing something harder for shorter amount of periods. So if like, for example, English, let's just use English for a moment. Um, if you want to improve in speaking and communication and you're always doing the thing you're used to, like talking in the same way and you're not going to get exhausted from talking. So what happens is you're going to have to keep talking longer and longer to keep that consistency going because consistency reduces how much energy and effort you're putting into it. it that's why you can do it for a really long time so if your goal is to do something for a really really long time you're gonna you can do the same thing a lot for a really long time to improve the performance it's gonna get really, really long. So you have to overload somehow. It's progressive overloading in both in intellectually and physically. So when you do that two hour routine, you, you have to ask yourself when you're doing the routine, do you feel exhausted? Like, did you get to exhaustion, right? Not like over exhausted, did you get to a point where you're doing more than you did before so there are two ways there are two ways you can tell one way involves recording one way involves recording and one way involves feeling and i'm gonna tell you now consistently feeling is way less reliable than recording so when you come up with a routine right the very when you complete that routine it has to be slightly more than you think you can do on paper if you feel tired and it lines up with that then you do that until you don't feel tired anymore like you do that routine until you don't feel tired and then you add to the routine so you're always on the edge of feeling tired and that's how you know literally when you're recording that you're doing more than you have done before in the same amount of time. Uh, generally speaking, this is what progressive overload looks like. And it works for your schoolwork. It definitely works for your schoolwork. You just have to adapt it, right? Contextualize when do you feel exhausted? Well, uh, a lot of times like reading something, if you read something and it stops going inside your brain, like you've forgotten what you read a second ago, that's usually mental fatigue. So most people would find where their mental fatigue sits in and you do a cutoff there. And you generally aim to constantly be a little bit past mental fatigue. And it's the same principle. So if you're ever wondering how I got through PhD, that's, that's, that's how I did my PhD work. In fact, I overtrained. I love, my, I love the whole university life so much that I actually burned out. So you're trying to prevent burning out, which overtraining is a physical version of burning out. And that means your mind is still going, but your body isn't keeping up kind of thing. How open would you be like an interview of sorts just talking about O's and speed training? I'm working on a speed training video right now. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to say anything. Uh, I can answer questions. I, I'm, I'm really open to answering questions. Recently, I've been having a really bad tendency to overthink and placebo yourself. No placebo yourself. 
like thinking something is different about your setup. Oh, okay. Wait, so what happened when you placebo yourself? Like your setting is making you better? So when you overthink, you change up your setup and because you hope it is a new setup, it'll make you better kind of thing. That type of placebo. Oh, you go crazy. Oh, you're wondering if it is because of your setup. Trying to figure out what's wrong. Yeah, so you're trying to figure out what is wrong or what's not undesirable. I see. Um, ultimately, ultimately is uh, I think the underlying thing about uh, really, really high efficiency players is that um, like when you become incredibly efficient, the biggest challenge to performance is trying to figure out how you get to that point reasonably. As in reasonably, safely, and quickly. And I, I, I want to be realistic with you here. When you approach a glass ceiling, there, there's going to be a chance that there's going to be a glass ceiling. I, I don't want to give you the unrealistic uh, feeling that there's no, there, there might not be, there might be such diminished return on your efforts, it might actually cap you. The idea is though, you can do so many other things too with that extra time. So you can also become efficient at steadily improving while liberating time to do other things, which you will naturally be improving in other things. So the goal here is to reduce your amount of session time, to maximize your resting time, to really know if you're at a glass ceiling, right? If you're really knowing that the stuff you're used to and the stuff that you're doing now is having diminished return. Uh, you can't know if you're never rested or like if you're pushing so hard that you don't get rested. Questions is the main thing. I'll gather questions. Do you have a Discord? I do. Uh, it should be in the YouTube link or the Discord link. Uh, I mean, not Discord link or the Twitch link. By any chance, do you know of any desktop apps that dump all the messages into one chat from different platforms so viewers don't have to switch between? I don't, unfortunately. Worm. And just recently, uh, you know, uh, when I started YouTube simulcasting, that's when Twitch lifted the whole simulcasting thing. So yeah, no idea. No idea. Uh, well, at least me, I haven't explored it, you know to uh, combine them. I know muscle growth is tied to hormones in a way and my hormones are out of whack right now so maybe that could be it. That is part of it. Oh, the Discord is actually in the About section. So if you click on the About section somewhere on YouTube, it should be in there. Uh, and then the Discord, I'm the admin, so you can just DM me on Discord. It, it's somewhere. Um, so muscle growth, right? So the hormone side of things, right? Here's here's the here's the one thing about the hormone side. Let's just say, I you might be alluding to some genetic component, like you know, like maybe some people have more human growth hormone, right? The whole idea of like testosterone and that. So here's, here's the thing. If you're comparing to yourself, if you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, that's untapped potential. So a lot of times when you're resting, if you shorten your sessions, all that extra, extra hours, you can improve your sleep hygiene and your diet. Um, hormones, can also be environmentally normalized. So if you have poor hygiene, like sleep hygiene, I'm not talking about like cleaning clothing and stuff, uh, that might help too. If you have poor emotional hygiene and intellectual hygiene and like dieting and stuff, 
that's where you get your you can tap into normalizing your hormones because uh for example a great hormone counter example is that if you're if you have poor sleep hygiene and you have poor diet your cortisol levels go up like a lot of times people talk about dopamine right dopamine ep norepinephrine and epinephrine like adrenaline stuff the opposite is your stress hormones which are like cortisol and stuff well they impact your state of mind like if you're really always feeling drained mentally and physically spending time on your sleep hygiene and your diet will greatly enhance not just posts but typically holistically it affects everything you're doing so you'll get better schoolwork your schoolwork will get done faster there are a lot of things that can overall boost your performance in posts but really it just boosts you and usually the first thing that you have to look at for untapped potential is the things you have to do as a human being like you can't it's not optional to suck at these things if you suck at sleep and you suck at eating that's untapped potential it if I had to choose for an O's player, like a top 10 O's player who is doing eight hour sessions, I would choose for them typically to do two hour sessions and use those six hours to focus on their sleep hygiene and their diet if it's not in check. Because those things, it impacts everything. It even robs you of placebo. If you're feeling good, like if your sleep is good and your diet's good, placebo can drive you easily 15 to 30 percent of your performance output like placebo is really powerful if you're in the right state of mind and feeling oh can i go to the next song uh let's choose this one <laughs> I dropped a link in YouTube chat for Discord, or is it not visible? It's not visible. That's kind of weird. Worm. That's weird. I don't see it on the other side. Is a co consistent sleep schedule as important as the amount of sleep? Ooh, that is a million dollar question, Larry. I sleep about eight hours, but it's RNG when I sleep. I have insomnia. Uh, when I was younger, like probably around your age, I think that's pretty much check out around your age. I struggled a lot with sleep hygiene and sleep hygiene is talking about the consistency aspect. Having eight hours is great. The answer is both. Right? You're not. So instead of comparing the two, do both. So if you're already sleeping eight hours, that's a check mark. You got the eight hours checked down. Now, scheduling sleep consistently for the eight hours is better than having one or the other. So when you're talking about life skills, it's all of the above. It, um, it's not about, uh, at least try not to, I encourage you to try not to focus on choosing one or the other. It's working towards both. So, um, Here's an illustration. A lot of times in science, when you're thinking about uh, improvements, like life improvements, usually the improvements are not seen with an improvement of one parameter. Oftentimes, the only po the dramatic statistical positive effect occurs synergistically between two things. So when it comes to sleep, I would say it's neither. It's both. So when your sleep is consistent and you get eight hours, that's when you see a significant statistical improvement. When you do one or the other, they are likely to be statistically fairly insignificant. If I had to pick though, which is what you're asking, if I had to pick, a consistent sleep schedule tends to reinforce uh, more things than uh, the amount of sleep. However, they're very close. 
when they work, when it becomes goaded, is when you have both. So if you look into like research and stuff, generally speaking, the synergistic effects between the two are way, way greater than focusing on one or the other. And you already got eight hours down. So that's one check mark. Now having some consistent sleep schedule is aiming for that might help within the feeling of insomnia. Uh, insomnia, so you, it, it's kind of a little different. Let me be a little su specific about insomnia. You're sleeping for eight hours, so you're not an insomniac at the moment. However, you're incredibly high functioning. That's what that's telling me. So if it's RNG when you sleep, it also means that what you do fluctuates. So a natural way to get more consistent sleep schedule is also having a consistent schedule in general, right? You're medicated for your insomnia? Oh, oh, okay. So the eight hours is actually medicated. Oh, okay. That's different. I was assuming you were naturally falling asleep for eight hours randomly RNG. I see. I see. Okay, so you're on sleep aids right now. Oh, and by the way, none of this stuff is like, you should follow your doctor's advice and whatnot, right? A lot of this is, I'm not a, I'm not a trained professional when it comes to this stuff, uh, especially medic, uh, using sleep aid. However, it is ideal that you're able to wean off it. Yeah. Uh, right now, you're decently strict high caloric diet right now, okay very underweight because of oh yeah uh i'm i kid you not that is a super common thing for someone who's high functioning uh if you're incredibly high functioning at an early age uh you're gonna be underweight and you're gonna have uh high activity low sleep and you're gonna be so high functioning that your diet falls by the wayside as in not about like we're not talking about like cholesterol and all that stuff you're just gonna under eat and you're gonna be like when i was uh, 18 or 19 right around my college years i was underweight i was like 105 pounds i don't know uh that in kgs right now but it's statistically below average and then when i worked even harder going on it, it ate into my life so now i'm a healthy like actually on the other, slightly on the other end. So, yeah, you're just not hungry. Yeah, you're just not hungry. And it's a very common trend on high functioning people. So if you're high performing, actually, I'm gonna be, uh, here's a hot take here. I wouldn't be surprised if the vast majority of the top 100 is having problems with uh, possibly thinking they're high on the spectrum, so ADHD, um, uh, always preoccupied so that they can't sleep, and incredibly preoccupied to the point that they undereat, and then have a developed eating disorder, a potential developed eating disorder, where the rationale is that uh, somehow you link having to do something with overriding what your body needs for maintenance right and then uh drop in appetite drop in appetite is incredible so uh oftentimes a high functioning person who's in a high performance like video game or something uh would have behaviors where they do not find eating appealing it gets in the way of stuff and then it also limits their eating palate a lot of times uh, all these are associations but they're very statistically co uh, correlated with each other not just for O's or a lot of things and before the internet it's people who are high functioning in education like in college undergraduate like undergraduate work PhDs a lot of times it's associated with the high functioning people um, 
when you fall asleep when it depends right i'm glad you know as long as you keep in mind that i'm just a stranger who only has a like reasonable scientific background i'm not a med trained medical profession and you're trying to wean off the sleep aids i hope that's working i hope you can train off the sleep aids um i have one thing about the sleep aid thing which i can tell you in a bit how i didn't end up taking sleep aids in the end sounds right just like never hungry until i'm doing yeah until i'm doing nothing yeah uh, like you're uh you're trying to occupy the time with eating right if you have nothing to do and you're kind of bored or maybe you're watching a show or an anime right if you're watching an anime and you want to do something with your hands or mouth that's oftentimes when you start finding yourself snacking and even that snacking is not sufficient to keep your weight up right uh, i actually literally know someone with all your patterns that you have uh noted and you have ADHD meds, I see. And it destroys your appetite. <sighs> yeah. That's... That sounds very... It's definitely possible. I know some people who would fall under that. Yes. Um, you are checking... Uh, you are checking all the boxes here. And the more it checks together, the more statistically likely these are the cases, right? So here's the thing about the sleep aid thing. Um, I don't know if this experiment has been able to be done yet, um, or for a long duration, but generally speaking, sleep becomes very natural if you find a way, and this is very hard, find a way in which you find a way in which in the amount of time that you have, say you're sleeping for eight hours, you need to sleep for eight hours by a certain time. The goal of trying to meet that is to find complete intellectual and physical exhaustion in 16 hours. I know, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever tried to inspire you to think about that. In my, in my experience, when I was younger, I did not sleep. I actually just embraced it. Like, I slept for two to four hours every, every single day. And it was not good. It was not manageable. My, once I got older and older and I had to do more things, I, it just went downhill. The, the tipping point was that I was able to engage myself, both intellectually and physically, to exhaustion within 16 hours the goal is to try to get into a state of being tired the moment yeah public school was yeah let's not talk about the enforced public school i actually go every other day without sleeping a lot of times so when you go to a public high school um instead of going to bed i just go two days at a time like just stay up and play video games and then just go to school the next day and that gets me to the exhaustion point was that good well my sleep quality went up but my sleep hygiene went down so what i mean is the consistency of my sleep schedule went down and it's not manageable but the sleep quality when i go to sleep it went up so when i was younger it was manageable because when you're young you kind of bounce back really well I'm 36 now, by the way, so that is not, that's not kosher. If you're, uh, the reason why I would say it's encouraged that you work on these things while you're young is when you get older, you become a little stricter and stricter in how you need to do that. I find I actually want to sleep if I plan on studying when I wake up and I'm not in college yet. I'm preparing lots. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah. When you plan on studying when you wake up, it's like the speed thing. So, yes, contrary to what a lot of people think, when you wake up and you're like awake awake, so in the morning you have a warm-up routine, right? Your brain has a warm-up routine, so the first 10 minutes is not the, it's a warm-up routine. But right after you wake up, 
and you're like sharp waking up that's when you practice your speed your speed component which is when you're studying in fact if you really want to i know you don't sleep very well but uh for those who do napping coming back napping coming back takes advantage of the sharpness so you're doing micro doses of resting in between so whenever your brain goes off a cliff after like 30 minutes this is very relevant to adhd by the way um i'm i never actually seen a psychiatrist before however i'm kind of high on the spectrum i i would say and my goal is that i rest whenever my brain goes off to neverland when i have mania i've come up with routines to rest without actually sleeping so if you're like overwhelmed and you're exhausted sometimes you can meditate or you can clear your mind or something those are skills that are also helpful to trying to manage and time when you're sleeping or when you're trying to sleep right like getting to the point where you're exhausted so you definitely that's kind of the goal when it comes to sleeping i think to form a consistent sleeping schedule if you can't do it intellectually like you can't just do like mind tricks and stuff to get yourself to bed the greatest asset is to use your body to tell you and doing lots of things during the day and syncing up when you're tired is generally the way i go i would recommend what does that look like unfortunately without being your doctor right like the person you should really be sharing what makes you exhausted what makes you excited all that stuff and the person that knows most about that you can probably like somehow schedule all these things in a way that when it's almost time for you to sleep you'll be exhausted by them it that's that would be my thought about how to go about that i find i actually want to sleep like plan right here's a question yeah consistent eight hours is good but does the time you sleep and wake up matter okay uh like 10 p.m to 6 a.m against you know like night owl versus like uh during the day yeah all my friends are asleep before 10 a.m or in class so that's fair enough all your friends sound quite healthy in a classical way i'm a huge pacer and any peripheral movement at all takes my focus from the game absolutely uh I can't, but you managed to do, you managed to play O's very well. I can't even concentrate at all. Like, if, if you watch through the 30 days, I struggle with attention like crazy. However, I don't strive to be great at O's, so I'm not like running an uphill battle here. I'm actually taking a point of least resistance here. Um, so about the question yeah cons uh does the time matter so of course let's reinforce it's all the above so if you can time it the ideal time is when you see sunlight so um even in training sunlight can work to some extent so a lot of times the thought experiment the thought experiment is that uh Say you want to get used to the day-night cycle, right? You have to literally be exposed to sunlight. That's what they're talking about. So if you're telling me, like, say your lifestyle is you never see sun. Like, you just don't see sun at all. You're just, like, uh, in a cave bunker somewhere, and you don't see sun at all. Well, that's irrelevant what time you sleep, because you don't have sun exposure to begin with, right? Now, the question is, Oftentimes, when it comes to the time you sleep, 
deals with active sun exposure. And it's with or without sun exposure. Typically, having sun exposure helps normalize your sleep cycle. So it's an extra tool that you can take advantage of to sync your time schedule. And the re and there's a lot of pragmatic things like what are the practical motivations? Like if you don't feel physically that that's true, let me appeal to your logic. Most people have you being awake during the day, right? Uh, most people have you being awake during the day. So if you're thinking about it logically, it just there's pragmatic reasons you want to be up during the day because most people are up during the day and if you're going to college you're gonna have to be up during the day so even if you don't feel it's true you can at least say from a performance standpoint right from an efficiency standpoint that you're going to have to be up during the day so yeah and i imagine you probably blocked out the sun. I've done that as well. I've gone through a phase of blocking out the sun all the time. So to answer your question, you probably have minimum sun exposure already. So to at the current state, I would argue it doesn't matter because you don't have sun exposure. So the idea now is what can you gain from sun exposure? Like what does the sun offer you? right being exposed to the sun during daylight any daylight like if you go to sleep at 6 a.m and what happens if you saw the sun the sunrise at 6 a.m for example that can do that can interfere or not interfere generally speaking though like for example i'll take my schedule i wake up at noon so around noon time and I go outside to run for 30 minutes. And that's my sun exposure for the day. Um, m most people can get around five, five minutes to 30 minutes of sun exposure. And it, it will be very difficult to know if it's better for you or not if you spent a really, really long time without sun exposure. So, until you do that, and my favorite tool that I like to do is, hey, if you're a pacer, like you just mentioned you're a pacer, whenever you need to like let your ADHD, right, let your ADHD take hold, walk outside if there is sun, right, and just stand there and let your ADHD take over. Like what I mean is let your mind wander in that five or six minutes and then come back in and then do your normal thing it's minimum you're already coupling it with something that's all constantly happening with your life right and you can find out how much sun exposure helps five five minutes you don't have to put on it's still encouraged to put on sunscreen but one to five minutes is usually all right and typically most people are to aim for like six days of the week with five to or so minutes of sun exposure and you can see if that helps you with your sleep hygiene uh, sun exposure the most consistent element of sun exposure is regulating your body so how how you're going up um, how you're going up and down in it so i go on walks more if it wasn't freezing and dark yeah yeah so the other the other thing is if you have a house uh, like if you have a house if you have a place in your house that has a window uh, like a, a window that is pointed at where the sun is during any part of the day and you can sit there and like let your mind wander because I, I know what it's like to be distracted by everything and if you have a safe space like a emotionally relaxing place and there's a window there just having the sun hit you and see how that works yeah sunroom yes 
if you have a sunroom, that's what I had pictured in my head. So, whenever you have like mania, or when I say mania, when you have like distracting thoughts and whatnot, the sunroom. And then being exposed to the sun, you can probably figure out and feel out what does the sun do to you. When you're chronically in the dark, it's really difficult to know how the sun's going to impact you, right? So you have to do it. Like there's, as, as much as I like to cite like research says this, research says that, what research says, like some of the current research says is that sun helps normalize your circadian rhythm. It gives you, it kind of syncs up your sleep cycle. It uh, sun can trigger a ready response. So like when you rise, your energy level and stuff is also synced with sun exposure. So that's kind of the gain thing. It can induce scheduling. It's not to say that you might end up being happier or like overall psychologically or it's pragmatic or something. If you work a night job, you're not going to get up during the sun. Sunlight. Some people do though. Just saying though, it's not necessarily like it's hard to gauge. So I would probably try to couple it with something that you already do. Like if you walk away from your desktop every once in a while because your mind is just wandering, sunroom. If the sun's up, right? And that would be a lean, low effort way to maybe see what happens. I personally absolutely love going outside. There's not a lot of excuses too though, other than hanging out with friends, but you know they got college. That's fair. Um, walking outside uh, for myself, like as an example, uh, it's meditative. So I practice meditating, or I practice brainstorming. Uh, when I walk out, and when I go out for a run now, what I do is I think about what I need to stream about. So you can make it a place where you're thinking about something and practicing focus and whatnot. So as opposed to uh, walking out and trying to blank your mind, sometimes blanking your mind, it doesn't really work. So when I think of meditation, uh, I don't really think about like a blank space. I actually think about the stuff that I know how to do. Um, that's an option. Because you're trying to think of something that calms you down, right? So, if you close your eyes and sit in the sunroom and just think about all the circles you're clicking, that could be relaxing. I, I think it's a very poor stereotype sometimes when people think uh, being a meditative state, like going out and enjoying the sun, has to do with literally going out in the sun and appreciating how like everything is calm kind of thing right there are different ways to get yourself to feel calm and enjoy sun without necessarily having your friends around uh i noticed that you mentioned nail biting that is a chronic thing yeah that would be very attached to high function uh i twitch i i uh i call it fidgeting i fidget a lot and there's a way i fidget um, sometimes people might notice it on cam, but I fidget a lot. So there are things like I, like my mic doesn't really actually move all the time, right? But I keep pulling it back and forth all the time. So instead of biting my, so I don't bite my lips or my nails, but that can be substituted. Uh, you can substitute that with another habit. So the habit I choose is doing something else. Uh, I play live service games for fidgeting too. So uh, I'm actually doing stuff with my hand and my right hand right now that's like off screen. It's like below here. So yeah, there are things you can offset if nail biting is a problem. Which nail biting can be a problem. Uh, sometimes biting your lip, lip biting, teeth grinding, those are fidgets. And you have to substitute it with something else. I don't know how... It's very difficult if you're not into uh, establishing new habits yet. Because your schedule... You know, one thing at a time, right? It sounds like you're worried about a lot of things at once. And the idea is... 
one thing at a time, right? Um, especially if someone who has ADHD, you definitely don't want to be juggling so many things. But for the nail biting thing, um, being able to associate something else with nail biting over time can substitute for it. So, uh, one thing I used to do is I used to tap a lot. Like, I, like what I mean is not post tapping. Like, I used to tap on a piece of surface all the time, and it's incredibly inappropriate, and it doesn't work with other people, right? In fact, when I hear someone else tapping, it drives me insane. So, I need to... So, what I ended up doing is every time I decided to tap, I spun my pen. And I continue to spin my pen. So like, whenever you say, whenever you catch yourself nail biting, right? If you catch yourself nail biting, immediately do the thing that you're telling yourself to do. Eventually, you can choose between the two. And nowadays, when I'm in a classroom, I spin my pen, like around my thumb. So, or like between my fingers. So I, I spin my pen instead of like tapping on my desk. So there are things you can substitute and you're not losing anything, you're just substituting it. So, um, that's usually a way that you can approach it. Find something that you can do anywhere, just as much as nail biting. Unfortunately, nail biting, you can do anywhere, right? So. What can you couple with? Um, when I... One of the terrible things about ADHD, in my opinion, is that uh, you get hung up on things. You get hung up on things a lot. So there are things that suddenly catches your attention, then you spiral off that, and then you've lost track of you know, the thing that's happening, especially when talking to someone. So over the years, like maybe 10 or plus years that I've come to kind of accept maybe I'm somewhere on the spectrum is I'm not saying I'm hot, like incredibly it's like incredibly debilitating um, it's not really incredibly debilitating on my part uh, sometimes I have bouts of mania but it's not that bad now um, I try to play a game with myself I tell myself that I build a habit now where if I'm thinking of a, another thought, I practice connecting that thought to what's going on. And that's what I do all the time. So now that I'm talking about these things, I call them digressions now. Um, I record myself doing digressions because I'm practicing the act of, oh, if my thought spirals, I have to and get caught up in things. I'm actively practicing. It's exhausting, by the way. It's incredibly exhausting. And the goat here to connect back to sleeping is I do it nonstop. Every time I'm doing it, it means that my attention has snapped somewhere else. And the more I practice that, the more exhausted I become. And I keep taking on more because it helps me get to sleep at night. Right? I end the day incredibly mentally exhausted. That helps me get to sleep. Uh, physically, well, I mean, I run, and it's sometimes I, I'm not a very an active person. Like my body is not that great physically, so it doesn't take much to become physically exhausted. But when your mind is still spinning like crazy, you don't get any sleep. Like in, in the end of the day, the goat is if your mind's exhausted, typically you can get some sleep. It, it's a lot. It's a little bit harder if you're not physically exhausted at the same time. But generally speaking. If you keep trying really, really hard to stop something from happening, like ADHD, like when your mind snaps away, if you spend most of your time trying to juggle that, I'm gonna bet that you'll feel really, really tired when you have to go to bed. That's one of the things that I spend, I use to my advantage because I suck at sleeping. Not so anymore. However, since my I think about a lot of things. I try to use it as that advantage. I keep challenging myself to do that. 
and it ends up leading to having better sleep. So, um, you're looking, in my opinion, I would encourage you to look for something like that. Not literally that. Um, some sort of balance between your college work or your future college work, your OS, you're trying to add and build up in a way to promote exhaustion and tie it all the way back to the beginning about your focus on performance. That is performance. You're taking advantage, you know, if you're a high functioning person, you're taking advantage of how high functioning you are while syncing it to hygiene, to sleep hygiene. So yes, if you're having RNG while sleeping and you're taking sleep aids, that's untapped potential. It's untapped use. If you're having trouble sleeping, in my opinion, this is kind of victim blaming, so be careful of this. Don't don't blame yourself if you don't. If you think like it's not an excuse to say, oh yeah, I'm not working hard enough. That's why I don't sleep very well. I, I don't want to encourage that type of line of thinking. What I'm trying to encourage is if you are having trouble sleeping, it also means you have a lot of untapped fuel to do something else. What does that look like? It's up to you. For me, I keep juggling more and more things constantly until I'm tired. So if I can study, play video games, read a book, like write a novel, do a digression, all of that, all in 16 hours, I just keep piling on. Just keep piling on until 16 hours, I can't possibly do anymore. Like, here's a, here's a crazy example of when I was younger and I was like incompetent. I just didn't know how to ed like stimulate myself. One time, I volunteered to just drive 16 hours to somewhere, get some food and drive back. And that night's sleep was amazing. So the goal is to safely do it, right? Don't, don't like, I, I don't want to encourage you to go extreme and then suddenly put yourself in a compromising situation, but you're edging. That sounded kind of lewd, my bad. You're, you're trying to get to a point of exhaustion and it does deal with performance too. So O's and all that stuff. Oh yeah, this is a digression. So this is going to be uploaded for sure. Uh, this is something that I talk about a lot. Every time I play a video game, oftentimes I'm thinking about these things, but generally speaking, what I'm practicing is what keeps me getting to bed at night. So when I stream and do all this stuff, it's on top of everything else that I've been doing my entire life, like eating, sleeping, going to uh, going do fitness, catching up on science, reading about psychological experience. I, like I'm doing all that still on top of all of this, because to me, if you truly are a high functioning person, you need to do all of this stuff to get a good night's sleep. So if there's anything encouraging that I would say to someone who's clearly high functioning, trying to find safely how to balance utilizing all your excess energy is probably one of the first steps to getting better sleep hygiene. And in the, at the same time, you're getting more performance everywhere. Like, the more you juggle, the more you're going to perform. And the downside, here's a really big downside of Flary. I did mention that if you get too used to something, you become more and more efficient, right? So it's an endless struggle. Like eventually, stuff aren't engaging to me anymore. So it will still be a struggle as you're getting older. You'll have to learn new techniques to learn how to relax, like learn skills to get into sleep, not to perform more. Because like once you get really good at all the things you do, it's going to take more. And there's not enough time in the day to do that. So like right now, I'm kind of at the edge. I'm sleeping between five and seven hours. And that's still okay. At some point, I have to keep thinking of new ways to not become efficient anymore. And that's 
I have to work harder. So I had to learn new things. That's how I get exhausted. I constantly learn new things. And on YouTube, what I'm doing is I'm recording how to learn. Because I love learning. It leads to a lifestyle that I can sustain. So how do I learn things is the most important skill I have because I need to keep learning new things so that I feel exhausted by the end of the day. And when you learn enough things, this is a long story short, but when you learn enough new things, you actually forget old things. That's a really long discussion in another video somewhere. But biologically, how your brain works is that eventually when you try to form new memories, you make room by calling and overriding older memories. So eventually, I believe, for a high-functioning person, you'll keep learning new things at a rate that one day you can revisit old things and they will feel like new. And then you keep recycling. You just keep doing that back and forth and hopefully you live a wonderfully happy life. Because one of the th really terrible things about ADHD and high functioning ADHD for that matter is staying engaged without overworking yourself. Because your body is going to fail you far faster than your mind is going to. And that's probably what's happening with O's if you feel like you're overtraining. There's not enough variety to keep your high energy up. Your mind is saying go, your body is saying no. So you gotta use other parts of your body. Like, I don't know, kicking something. Kicking something is kind of nice. I, I don't know, like, by, get like a punching bag or something. Uh, what else we got? What about sleeping with the windows not covered? I sleep with the windows not covered. Would that help with weight? Yeah. So here's two things. I, I would say, not professional advice, by the way, just experimental. Two things. Uh, two things I offer to actually someone like you right now, who's a personal friend of mine now. Um, space heater or like a heater slash cooler. So a fan that cools and heats right next to your bed, okay? A window that's exposed at a time of day. When the sun hits you and wake up, turn the space heater on and elevate your body temperature. And then do that for a couple days and see what happens. When you're going to bed, try to cool it down. So, you know, have a fan running for a little bit and cool down your body temperature and then go to bed. Uh, it's more ideal if you can program it to stop, like stop cooling and stop heating but heating when you're getting up you can just stop it like turn it on so if you can elevate your body temp along with sun exposure that would be great that would be something to start with it may yeah oh though that may just be my brain adjusting to normal focus that's oh, oh wait let me read the rest first uh, so windows not covered, that's definitely worth experimenting. I do have my windows not covered when I go to bed. Definitely more on edge recently, but it's slowly going away. I'm usually in a very good mental state and all. That sounds amazing. That's great. So overall, you already have enough hygiene to stay in a good mental state. Get that I should probably get going and study and play a game, but thanks to your advice, I'll skip those today and make a slight routine max it. Okay, if you upload this, I'll probably go back. Sure, sure, I... Hey, uh, before you go, Flaring, as a person, I, I don't know if you have problems with this, but if you have ADHD and high-functioning stuff, I would say one of the goats in my life is finding ways to find it useful and fun and engaging to repeat yourself. So how's that related? 
you don't have to take all the notes and the stuff from what we discussed here. I am perfectly happy to repeat, rediscuss everything in a different context. Because that keeps me engaged. So just like you, where you like to practice at consistency, I practice consistency with these things. So definitely feel free. Like you can always like DM me random thoughts and whatnot. I actually am doing this with a bunch of people nowadays. It's kind of what I think I'm going to do, hopefully, in the future, professionally in some way. But definitely if you have random thoughts, mania with your friends and whatnot, I'm always available because that's what keeps me active. I'll continue pushing O's until I find the ceiling. The dip in improvement pays directly correlate with me getting ADH. Oh, okay. Yeah, hyper-focusing. Oh, dude, hyper-focusing is such a tragic consequence of very long sessions. I hope you find some, uh, management. Yeah, and thanks for sharing. And they're like, I, I love talking about this stuff. This is why I play O's, actually. <laughs> I'm legitimately only playing O's to talk about these things. And of course, tomorrow's the last day of this. Then I'm going to be taking like a week or two. So definitely go about your day, man. Good luck and have fun. Thanks for sharing. It's pretty awesome. All right. All right, so we got to wrap this up. Yeah, we're gonna wrap this up here. And I will uh, cut this out. This will be the digression, right? This uh, half of it. Man, these these days, these like last two weeks of O's training, it, it's exactly the stuff that keeps me going. I do like interacting with the O's community in this way. Yeah, enjoy your night. Oh yeah, feel free, Flurry. Just drop a message anytime. I'm always looking at Discord when I'm not asleep which is you know five to seven hours of the day right other than that i'm always reading discord i i cannot it, it keeps me sane yeah it keeps me sane also actually you might have an insight about sleep consistency and improvement in coming time since i got my first job nice and the schedule is 12 hours Wait, wait, wait. The schedule is day, 12 hours, night, 12 hours, two rest days? Oh, dang. So you're going, you're going 12 hours one day, 12 hours night the next day, and then two days rest, and then you repeat that schedule? Or do you have 12 hour day, Two rest days. Oh my gosh, that's tough. Are you getting paid a lot? <laughs> I'm sorry, Worm. That might sound that might sound weird, but are you getting enough incentive? That's a really tough schedule. To be able to do uh, 12 hours in a day immediately followed by a 12 hour night. The two rest days are pretty reasonable. Two rest days is pretty reasonable. But back to back, I, I could understand 12 hour day, two rest days, 12 hour night, two rest days, like being rest days separated, but back to back, eww, that's, that's gonna be different. Huh. You're gonna have to keep me posted about that. That sounds... I'll have to think about that. That is really different. My mother occasionally has a uh, 12, like a day shift, meet a night shift, but she has to do night shifts. However, when she has night shifts, she still stays up for the day. So she's still getting sun exposure. Um, and that sun exposure is normalizing when she sleeps. It's just a... Uh, when she sleeps, when she's working, she's not working at her peak. She's working at the tail, like the second half of her stamina. So as opposed to like waking up to work, she is sleeping after work instead. 
It's enough for you, but I'm not sure if the sum would even tell you anything because my country's economy is in a- Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Worm. But prices and living costs are way different, I see. Oh yeah, and it's- yeah, it's hard to tell if you're being incentive enough, incentivized enough to do so. But, but that's a really tough schedule. And also, I, we have to take into account, your, your like, day-night cycle is very different over there too, probably. I would say. Especially where you are. I, I think it might actually be noticeably different. Well, you're gonna have to- I would love to hear your experience with that in the future. That's- that's kind of really different. I mean like, uh, the availability. Like, I don't know what your landscape is like, uh, Worm. Like your landscape, your time of weather, and all that stuff, right? Like, here, it's usually pretty consistent year-round. But I don't know what it's like over there. Actually, funnily enough, I thought... One more question. Alarm clocks, yay or nay? If you're working on sleep hygiene, right? If you're working on sleep hygiene, alarm clocks in the short term. For sure. If you can't... Uh, if you have no consistency, you have to force consistency, right? So, short term. And then laxer and laxer alarm clocks. It's kind of like uh, your meds and stuff short term very short term thing but usually a lot of people rise before their alarm clocks naturally after the long term if you're like really goaded in your sleep hygiene you'll eventually wake up very consistently even without an alarm clock a couple days or a couple weeks when you wake up to an alarm when it doesn't feel like it's an impediment then you stop, right? You're asking yourself when you can wean off things. So you only, you do it as long until you become not dependent on it. Although sometimes if it becomes a dependent, then you're gonna have to find a substitute for it, right? But the idea is that you hope that you have something that you're dependent on in the short term but become less and less dependent on in the future. So if you find yourself naturally waking up before your alarm clock, then you've done it. And that's kind of a telltale sign that you may not need your alarm clock as much as you need. A lot of people still set alarm clocks just in case. Like for me, I don't set my alarm clock at all. I always wake up before 12. However, when you start going to school, going to a job, you still set your alarm, but you don't necessarily use it. It's just there to be a backup, right? That kind of thing. It's a more peaceful alarm, better than an extremely loud one. Subjective. It's really up to you uh, to determine what that is. It's, it's incredibly tough on that one. Uh, there are other ways to ha not have an alarm. If you have a programmable space heater, like I said, uh, you can also have uh, program it to heat up when you're supposed to wake up that can be a natural way to wake up your body without actually using sound you can use feeling you can use sensory that's why uncovering your curtains to let the sun hit you that's visual so there are many ways that you can have an alarm show up and if you sync all of these up you can even go ham and do heating sun and the alarm clock, like the hearing all at the same time. It's like sensory overload, but all of them combined is still more powerful than one of them. So it's your take. You can choose how hard you want to go. If you're a hard, you know, if you want to go hard, you can definitely pile it on. Uh, what do I do is uh, I don't do any of that anymore. I just wake up at 12. Yeah. Yeah. Take care of yourself, Larry. You got such a bright future ahead of you. College soon, right? Good luck. Good luck. 
I've been at the schedule for the whole December actually. That's why I'm less present recently, but so far it's fine. Just getting used to it, so lacking energy for other stuff. Yeah. Um so for December period worm, I would say that's pretty alright. Is this job temporary? If you're doing this for life, that lack of energy might be a little bit alarming. Just a little bit. Um, I would say if you can sustain this for a year plus, I will have a better... I would be less concerned about your overall schedule. Like, at the moment, uh, if you're used to it, I don't think you should be treading any energy, right? If you're uh, starting to lack energy, it looks like uh, little things here and there to liberate more energy would be ideal. Because uh, it's very, very difficult to know what happens a year down the line. My burnout... I, I tell myself I burn as hot as the sun back, back in the day. But it actually took about five years before I truly burn out. And in the life of a human being, right? Now that I'm 36, five years is like a blink of an eye, right? I can summarize those five years. So oftentimes, in the moment, I think December, a whole December, is pretty reasonable for start. Um, typically though, most people don't want to see a lack of energy uh, in a month. Yeah, I would say it's usually, on average, good to go for three to six months before you start seeing a decline in anything that you usually have. But it sounds like you're making the best of it, and that's pretty wonderful. You have a change up in your schedule and whatnot. Yeah, keep me posted. I want to hear about this. And then, obviously, you're always free to DM too, if if uh, there are other things, right? All right, that was a great way to end day 30. Tomorrow's stream, right? Tomorrow's OS thing is summarizing all of this. I might train a little bit uh, tomorrow, but tomorrow we're gonna spend like three or four hours talking about what I learned in these 31 days. It is temporarily? Okay. It will be an option of possible Oh, traineeship slot at a local energy company that deals with substations and whatnot. Okay, that's great. That's awesome. Um, even, uh, even if it's, uh, permanent, right? Three or four years. For a young person, like you, Worm, and, you know, Flary and stuff, in your early days, it's nice to also always feel like it's temporary, like you have a next option. And that's wonderful to see that you have vertical movement available. Um, the last thing I would encourage, like, the last thing I want to encourage people at a young age is to be stagnant. Like, pursue something without any movement whatsoever. In, in my opinion, you guys are way too young. To start settling on something. Um, overall, I think the m more consistently dynamic you are when you're younger, because you can be, will set you up for a much, much healthier and consistent life when you get older. Um, in my opinion, obviously. So, that's nice to know that it is temporary and you have options to move up or move to a different thing. And maybe not necessarily with that type of schedule lined up. That schedule is really weird. If you can make it work, right? If you make that schedule work, tell me about it. Tell me what you did, how you managed it, because I would love to know uh, that. Because I can't imagine a way that it would be sustainable for many years. And if you manage to come up with something that's worth sharing that's also worth educating myself about someone who is able to juggle a day night shift back to back that's incredible in my opinion all right so we're gonna switch gears 
because I need to finish this next thing. But this was great. I love these discussions. 